Can you all hear me? Those who cannot hear me, please raise your hand. <laughs> I saw one hand going up. <laughs> Welcome, friends, for this monthly meeting we have here uh, organized by the Institute for the Study of Human Awareness, or ISHA for short. The purpose of meeting regularly is to allow our mind to go back on track. The spiritual path is uh, one where the mind in the beginning of our travel does not like, does not like to travel that way, likes to travel to other places outside and does not want to take the journey within. And uh, if we do not meet and remind ourselves of the importance of this journey within, then we lose track of it and get so busy in our day-to-day -day affairs, we get so busy with the obligations we have created for ourselves that we say we have no time to do meditation. We will do it when we have time. And then we never get time and so many people are waiting for the day when they will really be able to retire from all the things and start meditation. Most of them die before that day comes. So that is why when we meet frequently and bring our mind back to the priority of going within and discovering ourselves, then we go back on track. So we are able to pull back our attention to where it should belong. Otherwise, we are so lost in this world. This world pulls us. There are so many distractions and attractions that we are unable to focus on anything. We are living a life of confusion, uncertainty. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. And we worry too much. We worry all the time about what has already happened. We worry that we did something wrong. We could have done something better. This was not the best way to deal with things like we did. We are full of regrets and guilt, and we are sorry for people whom we hurt, and it occupies our mind, and then we are uncertain of the future. We don't know where to go tomorrow. We don't know what the plans will be, and we worry all the time. We worry, we fret about, and where is the time for thinking of going within and finding out who we are? And then it suddenly occurs to us, where is the priority? Why should we worry about meditation and worry about finding who we are? We know who we are. We are who we are. Why should there be something like that so important for us? If it is uh, interesting, it gives us peace of mind, it gives us some satisfaction, we can do it when we are free. So this is the kind of life we need. It is natural to lead this kind of life because of the nature of our mind. Our mind, first of all, looks for pleasures and fulfillment of desires. And since it can get nothing by closing eyes and meditating, it looks for these things in what looks like a more real world outside. And that is why we run to outside things constantly. We are, we are lonely. We think companionship outside will solve that problem. We are angry. We think we can shout at somebody and get the anger off our chest. We have problems. We think by interacting with people and applying our mind with people and problems, we'll solve them. These things don't happen like that. And we are constantly disappointment, uh, having disappointments. And we are uh, living a strange life in which we are restless, unsettled. That's unfortunate, but that is what a majority of us are living like. The question that why should we give a priority to Finding out who we are is because all these problems that I've just mentioned, all of them without exception, are arising because of our mind. And we are not our mind. So long as we identify ourselves with the mind and believe that the one that thinks in us, the thinking machine in us, is ourselves, all these problems will be real and will upset us all the time. By discovering who we are, by going within and finding out we are not the mind. The mind was merely 
a machine given to us, like a computer given to us to use, we alter the very type of life we lead. It's not that we just find out who we are. We are able to alter our entire life, our entire attitude towards everything. And we discover that most of these problems are self-created by the mind. And that if the mind was not so busy creating problems, it would not be in this mess that we are in. So the main problem that we have today is that we identify ourselves with the mind and face all these problems and live a mental life, a life where the mind dictates what we are supposed to do. Instead of our dictating to the mind what the mind should do as a very proper computer-like machine that we have been gifted with, we are asking the computer all the time what we should do. And the computer tells us varying kinds of uh, opinions and advice. The reason being, the mind can never be certain of anything. There is no thing, nothing in the world that the mind can be certain about. If somebody says, I am very certain about something, have a little discussion with that person for 10-15 minutes, that person will become uncertain and the doubts will start creeping in. Constantly, the mind creates doubt in us. And every time we have a doubt, we get afraid. Fear comes along with doubt. If you had no doubt, if your life was a life of certainty, you would have no fear either. Fear is a very easy and uh, constant accompaniment of doubt. So since the mind is built to create doubt, not because it is supposed to be a bad thing, the mind was supposed to create doubt so that we could examine something further. The mind was supposed to be skeptic so that we examine the truth further. It was not supposed to be to create doubt and fear and then live in that state. We were given a nice equipment to create skepticism, to create doubt, so that we can clarify and find out the answers. The difficulty is the answers do not lie outside of ourselves. We are searching for these answers outside constantly, from others, from books, from studies, from thinking with the mind. These are the only sources we are using to find answers to the questions which we think the mind can solve. Actually, the answers lie not in the mind, not outside, but within our own self. Our own self has some very wonderful attributes, functions, very wonderful functions, which do not belong to the mind, do not belong to this body, and they do not belong to this world, and they do not belong to anybody else. Those functions are the power of intuition, the power of knowing something spontaneously without having to think about it. This power of intuition given to us is a very valuable thing. We hardly ever use it. When an intuitive flash comes to us, when an intuitive knowledge comes to us, we spend time with the mind thinking about it and creating a doubt about the very knowledge we are getting. So we rule out intuition and give a preference to the thinking mind and therefore we are not using the most valuable tool that we have to get real certain knowledge. How do you get intuition? Intuition is a function of our own true self, of our soul, of our living, living force that which makes us alive, that which makes our mind alive, that which makes our sensory systems active, that power which we call life or consciousness, that power contains this function of intuition by itself. It does not come by practice. It's there already. It was there before anything was created. It was there before we were born. It will be there when we are dead. It's not a function of anything that is created. It belongs to that immortal self, which was neither born nor will die, which is our true self, our soul, our spirit, which is pure consciousness and it does not involve any thinking. It does not involve any study outside. The answers come to us immediately from intuition. The reason for that is that intuition is built over millions of years billions of years. Intuition is built into our consciousness ever since we have been experimenting with different forms of life in which we have been traveling in these three worlds of the physical and the sensory and the mental states. 
every time we go up, come here, we add more information and knowledge. Intuition picks up knowledge from all this experience of a very long time. The modern scientists think it is all in the DNA. That the DNA molecule, which is a part of every cell of our body and is a very prominent uh, part, it plays a very prominent part in our brain. They say that it is the DNA molecule that's carrying the entire history of our experience from inception, which was billions of years ago. So they themselves now recognize that there is something within ourselves, within our head, that can provide answers to where are we getting this knowledge from. If, if we were to see that we are born as a little infant and how long will it take to start walking? If this was the first time and there was no background at all to coordinate 257 muscles which are required to walk, would take at least 10 years or 12 years. But the children start walking after a year. Where do they get this knowledge from? Uh, the calf is born to a cow and the calf starts walking from the time of birth. When did it learn it, how to walk? How do we learn these things? When did we get a chance? If we were here only temporarily for one visit, it would take years and years to learn the things which we come equipped with right at birth. And that is why this business of knowing intuitively, knowing something, is not gathered by the mind. It is built into our self, into our own intuitive self. And that is why if we want to use intuition, we will get a life of certainty. To use intuition, we have to first know what the mind is and keep the intuitive knowledge away from the mind. I, I once met a friend, he said, I know how to develop my intuition. I said, how do you develop it? He said, I practice it. I said, how do you practice intuition? Because I thought that was just sudden knowledge that comes to you without knowing how it comes. It does not fit in always with your thinking. It's sometimes totally against what you are thinking. And how do you develop it? He says, well, I practice whenever I want to use intuition. I just practice. I said, give me an example how you practice. He said, now, for example, I want to know intuitively whether I want to go to New York or not. So I just look into my mind and say, ah, uh, no, not knowing. I said, what was that ah uh, for? That ah uh, is the process of thinking which made you say, I want not to go to New York. Intuition doesn't function like that. Thinking, thinking with the mind always occurs in time, even if it's a few seconds of thought. But intuition takes no time whatsoever, not even a nanosecond. It just exists as knowing of something suddenly. And we are full of that knowledge. We have so much of that knowledge built into us that if we tap into it, we would be fully knowledgeable about everything that is possibly can be known by a human being has all packed into us, in our soul, in our own true self. We don't look at our true self, we just rely on the mind and have become the mind. So that is why we're leading a very different artificial life than what we are supposed to be living. As human beings, we are supposed to be having the best of everything. We are supposed to have the best of equipment, the best kind of body that has all things built into such a small little frame. It's amazing how the um, how the body is built up, the anatomy and physiology of this body is amazing. It's, uh, it's a miracle by itself. Then on top of it, we have a brain that stores so much information. We have this DNA molecule sitting in the center of every cell of this physical body and giving us all the wisdom and guidance. It's giving guidance to each cell in comparison with each other. And these chromosomes in the cells, they are communicating with each other all the time, even when we don't know about it. They tell the heart to beat, we don't tell the heart to beat. They tell autonomous systems to work in us, we don't tell them. So much magical properties have been built into this system. And then we have some cells which are obedient to other cells. There are cells which have got only four of these chromosome windows open. There are some which have about eight open. And there is only one cell sitting in the center of the brain near somewhere near the pineal gland or the pituitary body, they have not been able to determine exactly, but somewhere there, one cell with all chromosome windows open 
all 46 operational and that's giving directions to all other cells through a series of hierarchical levels. It's such an amazing universe existing in us. It's such a government being run by our own small brain in the center. And that's where we are sitting as conscious beings. We are sitting in a storehouse of total knowledge. We are sitting in a storehouse of answers to all our questions. And they lie right inside us in the center of our head. We don't pay any attention to it. We try to run every other place. We go to libraries to study. We go to books. We go to seminars. We go to conversations. We go to dialogues with people to get knowledge. But the entire knowledge, entire possible knowledge is sitting in each one of us right in the center of our head. Have we ever thought that why not pay some attention to them? Then one of the biggest gifts given to us by the Creator is the power of attention, that we can put our attention wherever we like. We are not left in a state like a tree is sitting there with no power to move, no power to do what it likes. It just has to live its life. Insects are crawling, they are living instinctively. The birds are flying, living instinctively. Animals are living instinctively. There is, if you look around, there is no life form at all in this entire creation which has this facility to use attention where it likes. Human being is an exception. Human being has been given the gift of attention. It can put its attention where it likes and gather that knowledge. When we read a book, how do we know what the book says? We put our attention on it. When we talk to somebody and listen to that person, how do we understand what the person says? We put our attention on it. Have we ever thought that this great gift of attention with which we are acquiring superficial knowledge outside, if we put the same attention in the source of all knowledge, which is sitting in all of us, right in the center of our own head, that if we put attention there, how much knowledgeable we'll become? and we'll get all the answers to our question. When we get answers, with certainty, intuitive answers, then we get those answers from the center of our head, just by putting attention there. We get clarity, certainty, and have no doubts, and we lead a totally different life than what we're leading now. Such a simple step within the reach of all of us. Nobody is born without the capacity to put attention and to put the attention where you like to put attention is your own thing. It's, it is a volition, it's a gift given to you to put it wherever you like. This free will to put attention wherever you like is one of the greatest gifts to human beings. And where do we put the attention? On things which do not respond, things which don't give knowledge, things that create more doubt and confusion. That's where we are using our attention. Now think for a moment that here all the source of all knowledge, source of all clarity, source of therefore all happiness is lying inside us and we are searching outside. Imagine what would happen if we put our attention within ourselves at a spot within the center of our head. If we said let's see what's going on there and just concentrate our attention, another good capacity we have to concentrate our attention. If the attention was always scattered, we would not make much use of it. But we also have the power to concentrate our attention. Suppose if we were to concentrate our attention in the center of our own head, we'd have all the knowledge we want and our life will change. One step, the difficulty is that this requires withdrawal of attention from outside. We have never practiced that. We have never been told that. We have never been trained for that. All our training in education, in education institutions has been how to focus attention outside on outside things. So attention flows from the very spot where we are because attention is merely a function of consciousness. And we are conscious and alive, therefore we can put attention. If we become unconscious, we lose that capacity. When we are conscious, we have the capacity to put attention where we like. We have never learned how to pull back attention. We have always learned how to pull attention away from ourselves on our outside things. Even within our head, when we are thinking, we are thinking in an exterior way. We are thinking of things which are not where we are. 
We are facing things. We are looking at ideas, pictures in front of us. We are never looking at ourselves. The difference between focusing attention on something and withdrawing attention to yourself is very significant. It makes all the difference. If you focus attention on something, then you are trying to gather limited information about where you are focusing attention. When you withdraw attention to yourself, you learn everything that is there to be learned automatically. It's such an amazing experience. But withdrawal of attention requires a different kind of practice than focusing of attention. It's an unusual thing for us because we never used it. Once we start using the method of withdrawing our attention, then the practice becomes very easy after some time. How do we withdraw attention to our own self? We have never been taught. But there is a third fact besides attention and besides the power of concentrating that attention, we have a third faculty in us called imagination. Imagination is as powerful as these other two. If you can imagine something, Walt Disney said, if you can imagine something, you can do it. They're so powerful. Imagination enables us to create a, a location for our attention at any time we want. If we want to imagine that we are sitting on top of this building, we can for a moment actually feel we are at the top of the building and looking at things around us. Because the sensory perceptions that go with imagination operate independently of the sensory systems in the body. Imagination can take you as a being somewhere, anywhere you like. Supposing you were to imagine that you are in the center of the head. Supposing you were to imagine that you are sitting in the center of the head. <clears throat> exactly behind the eyes, exactly between the ears, exactly where we know consciousness is operating from. And do nothing but imagine that you are there. What would happen? Your attention will be withdrawn. Without imagination, you will always be focusing attention. By use of imagination, you put your withdraw your attention to where you are imagining you are. So these three things in combination are giving us the advantage <clears throat> of getting the best out of ourselves. To change our entire life, to change our attitude towards life, to have knowledge and clarity, which nothing else can ever give us, because it's all built into us, it's part of us. It's a natural gift to consciousness, to be conscious of anything it wants. It's an ability that the mind can never provide. It's an ability that nobody else can ever provide. It's an ability built into us. So if we imagine we are in the center of the head, where do we imagine we are? We imagine we are where we really are. If you want to say that you are just a point of consciousness, imagine that you are a point of consciousness and you close your eyes and think of the body and say, where is this point of consciousness operating from? It doesn't take too long to know it's operating from the head. You can actually feel that if you are merely a point of consciousness, then you are sitting somewhere in the head, somewhere in the middle. You can actually feel that that's the point from where you actually operate, from where you become aware of everything, from where you send your attention out to pick up things. You don't have to imagine somewhere else. You have to imagine where you actually are. With practice, you can do that too. With practice, you can first discover where you are as conscious beings. Not the body, but inside the body. Withdraw your attention there. All doors open up. We are so used to living a life with only the nine doors, the nine apertures on our body that open outside. The two eyes, the two ears, the two nostrils, the mouth and the two nodes, the apertures. These nine doors are creating a link with this world and we think that is the only way to experience life. That is the only way to know what life is. The tenth door is opening exactly where we are. The tenth door opens into a world in which you can go back into creation, you can go back into the ultimate origin of all things and yourself. You can go back to find where consciousness itself arose. You can go back and find who the creator is. You can go back and find the absolute total history of the creation of all universes. 
He always said things right in us, in each one of us. It's like a DNA molecule which says it contains history of our millions and billions of um, forms of life in which we have come through. It's the same thing that we say here is the collected wisdom, collected knowledge of all that experience, not from when the planet was born, from when creation started that we can go back, it's all already there. And I, what I am saying is not a theoretical model I am setting up for you, that you imagine this is how it can happen. I am saying, go and test it out, practice. This is not something for debate. This is not something in which we can take different points of view. Their materialists and idealists have been debating for centuries over this. The materialists say, no, there is no evidence that there is anything except what is the material world outside and the sensory perceptions are built into the body to pick up that information. There is nothing beyond that. The idealists say, that's not true. Because you can imagine things that don't exist here. You can in meditation have experiences that have no relation with any experience that you've had here. Where do they come from? If the entire knowledge that we had was built from material things. And this debate is going on and on. The idealists believe that the internal knowledge of ours creates the outside experience. They believe that what we see in this world is because of our perception. This, the perception does not give information of what is outside. Perception creates what is outside and at the same time gives us information what we say is outside. That means, <clears throat> they say, the idealists say, this world has been created like a movie cinema, like a movie in a theater. That just like when we go to see a movie, we look at the screen. Everything is happening on the screen. And we look at live characters there. And we are get so immersed in that knowledge that's what's going on there. We forget they're just shadows. We forget they're just pictures, they are not even moving pictures. They look like they are moving pictures. That these are still frames packed in a film behind us in a projector and the, uh, and the light in the projector is going through that film and is creating images on the screen and we think it's real. We cry, we wonder what's going to happen next. Now what will happen? We are on edge of our seats. We take it as so real. This world is exactly the same. I did say we are projecting this world and the film is laden in our minds and the soul, our consciousness is the light that pierces through that mind and projects that film and we see it in a multi-dimensional screen which we call this world. And therefore, the true nature of events happening outside is actually happening inside. We are seeing a projection of it. They have been arguing this for centuries. And the materialists have been saying, no, that's not possible. They say, if, if we don't have open our eyes, we don't see. If we open our eyes, physical eyes, then we can see. So how can you say that we are seeing because of what is inside us? And then we should be able to see even by closing our eyes. And the idea is saying, yes, you can see everything by closing your eyes. Just find out how this system works. Find out where the projector is. Find out if it, is it laden with the film and is it really projecting what is already in the film? So that's why when we go within our own self then we find that these things are all built into ourselves. We discover that this is not a matter of debate. It's a matter of experience. Unless you experience, you cannot say anything about it. We don't have any experience. We don't go with it. We don't even test it out. We keep on debating about it outside with people. What is real? What is unreal? That is unnecessary debate because you never tested out what is actually happening inside. And there are millions of people who are testing it out now. Millions of people are in a state of meditation having experiences which cannot be understood by looking outside at all. So what would happen if you really did that? Supposing we use these three powers, the power of imagination, and you imagine you are in the center of your own head, the power of putting attention there, that means you attend to where you imagine you are. The power of concentrating your attention there. The power of not thinking of anything else but that. What would happen? Your attention will gather inside you and you will suddenly find 
that your body was within your awareness because of the scattering of attention in the body. Your world outside was there because of scattering of your own attention. When you pull your attention back to yourself, then you begin to forget what was outside. You begin to be unaware, at least temporarily, you become unaware what's happening outside. Gradually, you become unaware of your own body. You become unaware of where your hands are. You become unaware of your, where your legs are. You begin to feel you are just floating somewhere. You begin to feel you are really somewhere else, another than where you are. And other things start happening. An inner light opens up. A new world begins to open up. A new imaginary world opens up. And you begin to see that imaginary world is far more beautiful far more crispy in its color, in its texture, than the world we thought was the only reality. We find there is such a big thing opening up. We see things of which there is no parallel existing here. Where is it all happening from? It's just happening because you have touched a nerve center of the opening of an awareness of an inner world that can only be seen by your inner self. It is there even now. It's there all over. But we are only using a very part, small part of our consciousness to observe this world and we think this is the only reality. When we put our attention by imagining we are inside the head and concentrated there, then new worlds begin to open up which are so remarkable. We find that we have a cell, a body. We even have a body like we have here. That that body is not governed by the rules of this world. It does not age. It can be any age that you want. It does not su suffer from gravity. It does not have weight. It does not have so many things. It can fly. It, and the whole world is all bright and lit up. That that world, you can see things in utter darkness because it does not require reflected light to see things. The light is in everything that exists there. You have a whole parallel of this world in a very beautiful, radiant form inside you. Such a treasure exists. And this is step one. If you want to discover what possibilities exist by going within your own self, this is only step one. The step two would be to go within that self, which has now been discovered by you to be different than this physical body, that you have another body, which holds the sensory perceptions in a much clearer way, a much better way than these sensory perceptions on the body, that you can see people who have uh, defective eyes who are using glasses have 20 20 vision in the inner self. You can read the most fine print that you like inside. You can read newspapers with print in the smallest things. Where do these come from? Where do these experiences come from? They belong to us. They are part of ourselves. We are not looking at that at all. Then, if you are able to do the same thing which you are doing in this body, that means discover. Where are you operating from as a unit of consciousness? In this body, we can know it's this head and it's in the center of the head. And it is somewhere where the anatomy people tell us is the pineal gland and pituitary body, somewhere in that area, right in the center, behind the eyes, between the eyes and in the back, between the ears. Similarly, we discover that in the new body we have, we function identically with a body which has a head. And in the head, you have the same capacity to imagine you are there and you can withdraw your entire attention. Like you are able to do from the physical body, you can withdraw your entire attention from that body. Then you open up something <clears throat> which is almost beyond description. You open up the capacity to see that the mind is the actually projector and the film with which all experiences are created both internally and externally. That the mind is the creator of all experiences. It's all stored up there. That you have so much storage space in that mind, much more than this brain can ever hold. And that storage is containing the information about everything. That when you say that the knowledge comes from within, that the knowledge was stored in that place. We call it the causal region of experience because it is causing all things to happen that we are aware of. We are not aware of anything beyond these three worlds. We are aware of what the physical world looks like. We live in it every day. 
We experience it sensory every day through our sense perceptions. We know that there is a world of imagination which we create in ourselves. We can live in that, fantasize in that, and we know that that can become more subtle if we are not putting part of our attention outside. When we put the whole attention that it all that imaginary world becomes a reality, more real than this world. When you go beyond that, you find that the causal mind was storing everything, that even what we thought were our sense perceptions, we are merely an expansion of perception, that the perception is one single function, that the perception means you know everything at once. It does not mean that you have to see separately, hear separately, touch separately, and then know. These have been divided from single perception, which we can't even understand here. And you can find out where it comes from. It's within ourselves. That's from where it's operating. That's a great experience. And these three worlds of the physical and the sensory and the mental are all being made up there. And you can go directly to your source and find out. You find out also that what we thought was your individual mind was not an individual mind, it was a shared mind. That what you thought were people who met you and had given different ideas to you, they were sharing your mind. That you are projecting a person with part of your thought and thought the other person thinks like this, I think like this. That the whole thinking process is a shared process from one mind. It's a great experience to know that a universal mind exists at the causal stage of creation and that all minds that we are operating here are participating in a single mind because we're projecting them. We're projecting over and putting different <coughs> ideas, how they speak to us, how they tell us things. We are projecting. It's our own internal speech that is coming to us from outside when we think physically everybody is all separate and their thinking is all separate. This is not the theoretical thing I'm saying. This is how you can experience and find out that's how it operates. Then, most of the people in the world who have ever had the highest kind of experience have ended there when they found a universal mind from where everything is being created. They say we find the creator. We found the creator. But that's not the end of the spiritual story, nor end of the spiritual journey. Because who is operating that mind? Who is operating? What is the life force, the power of consciousness that is making that universal mind work? Then you have to have the guidance of somebody who has gone beyond the mind. And there are such people available, but very few. In this physical world, some people are available and they will always be available. Because if we lose this connection, we are lost forever. There always will be people telling us, that is only the creative power of our universal mind, that you are beyond that, that the soul is not mind, that the soul of a human being, the source of consciousness, it is not the source of all creation, that we are using a mind by putting the source of all consciousness into a project, into a system, into a machine that creates the universes that we call creation. That's a very big development, a very big area of knowledge beyond all comprehension by anybody's mind. Because now we are talking of something by which the mind was created, by which the universal mind was created. Now we go to the source of consciousness itself and we discover that we can pierce that mind which has no form. It is not like the uh, sensory body or the astral body or the physical body. It's, it's a formless thing, but we give it a form to create forms. But when you pierce through that one, and in the head, conscious head, of the center of that body, which we call the causal body, you discover that the source of consciousness was not that. It was also dependent for its life. The universal mind was dependent for its life upon inner consciousness, which was the source of all life, of the mind, and of all worlds that have been created. That ability to go beyond the mind to the very source of consciousness is given to all of us sitting here. That, that amazes me the most, that here we are sitting, living in a very tiny fraction of possibility in this world, and we don't even know all this treasure is hidden right inside us. That we have so much information, knowledge, with the ability, not only in knowledge and information, ability to pierce, while we are a human being, to pierce through all this. When we go within the mind, and find out what is making it alive, 
we discover that is our true self. That's the consciousness that makes the mind alive. That's the consciousness that makes the mind alive and through the mind makes sensory systems alive and through them make the bodies alive, make this whole world alive. We can see it for ourselves. It's not a conjecture. It's not somebody saying it is possible. But saying it is possible does not mean you had any experience of it. There's still an area of doubt when you say it is possible. This is something you personally experience and once you experience that awakening, once you experience an awakening of that level, it's no longer a matter of any discussion that we are just living in a world which is created for having different experiences. We discover we are not in this state in the physical world to do anything else except to have experiences, different experiences. We love to have experiences. Why? Because we are consciousness. And consciousness subsists by being conscious of something. Whatever it becomes conscious of becomes creation. Our ultimate self, we discover, is a unit of consciousness which we truly call the soul. It is not the mind. It does not think. It has some powers by its own self. Without the mind, it can do certain things. And the one is that I mentioned right in the beginning, it has the power to know everything intuitively. That's our knowledge. Real knowledge is that when you discover who you are, you discover the power of intuitive knowledge. That the entire intuitive knowledge picks up upon the entire stored awareness of all kinds. It is not only that which is created, it is even knowledge of that which is not created. So that ability to find out that the source of all knowledge can be accessed by us through intuitive knowledge of the soul is wonderful. Second function of the soul by itself, without using the mind, senses or body, is the capacity to love. To truly love, to identify with somebody in a way that is much more than just being attracted, that two people get attracted. It's not equivalent to a love where you totally forget one and become one with the other. That identification, possible identification with another, that the thoughts of the other person should come so, so much into you that you forget yourself. That true love is originating from consciousness itself and not from the mind, not from the senses, not from this body. It belongs to our true self or soul. It's a spiritual experience. The third function it performs without the mind and physical systems is the capacity to appreciate beauty, joy, and have the experience of joy. That sudden joy which we get inside, bliss as we call it, because joy as we often connect with outside things. They say the state of bliss that is there, that state of the greatest high that you can have is coming from the self, from our soul, not from the mind. Not from the senses, not from the body. Here we are discovering that all the beauty and joy and experience of love and experience of intuitive feelings and knowledge is coming from our true self and not from the accessories upon that self, not from the covers upon that self. And we are paying attention only to the covers. Most of our attention is going on the outermost cover, which is the least permanent of all things, the physical body. Physical body is born, growth, old and dies. Everyone dies. Nobody lives forever in the physical body. Nothing lives forever. Not even inanimate things live forever. They destroy. I saw a documentary the other day. They said that man is responsible for what is the state of this planet today. Things did not happen naturally. And they then predicted, supposing man disappears, a human being disappears from this planet, what would happen? <laughs> then they say, then the other animals will start dying. And they give a picture in what will happen in 10 years, what will happen in 100 years, what will happen in 200 years, with no human being. Things will start decaying, all these tall buildings will fall, decay, even steel will de degenerate, and ultimately a few wild bushes may remain, no other material thing will remain without man on this planet. We have never known we are <laughs> playing such an important role in the preservation of a planet as we see it today. So they gave a picture of what will happen after 100 million years, there will be nothing left. So uh, that means what we have today is because a human being has been here. And a human being has been responsible for the state of our planet, which we are now enjoying and also destroying. But this planet was built up by this same conscious power, which can do these things. 
and all that ability is lying in every human being. When you go and discover your own self, that you are a unit of consciousness per se, <clears throat> that your spiritual self has, has a, a light, a radiance of its own, and not, <clears throat> not you have to depend upon seeing the physical bodies of each other through light, artificial light. We put so much artificial light, sunlight, in the dark we don't even see each other. What kind of life is this? Have you ever realized we're leading such a dark life that here a one step up in the astral plane, everything is lit up by itself. You don't need any light. You want to see something, it's the light of that. Have you ever noticed that when you imagine things in your head, those imaginary things, what light are they using that you can see them? You can close your eyes completely and you can have a totally dark room and imagine something, you can see it. Where does that light come from? The light is built into the thing that you are seeing. It, is, it may be very dim right now when we see, later become a little more. Ultimately you find that the light is built into the system. When you go and see your own soul, and you want to compare what kind of light is coming, and compare with the worldly light we have seen, this sun which we cannot even face. We cannot look at one sun out in the sky, if you put 16 of them together, that's the light of each soul that we are carrying inside this body. The light of the soul is equal to 16 suns of this, of this physical world. Well, how much light we are carrying inside ourselves? We are full of light. We have no idea how important this light is, that the light is the basis of our conscious being. That's coming from our own conscious self. It's coming from the source of consciousness. And we are relying upon ordinary light outside. And all the big light is inside us, a part of ourselves. This is a very big discovery to discover who we are. And we call those people who have been able to pierce the mind and gone to that state as perfect living masters. Why do we call them perfect living masters? <coughs> because they have reached the area of perfection. The all entire imperfection, concept of imperfection, and creating duality, pairs of opposites, and creating imperfection arises from the mind. When you go beyond the mind, is perfection. <coughs> if a person who is dead were to have that experience, he cannot communicate with us. If we want to communicate with a dead person, we are communicating with our mind, with our imagination. We are not communicating with that person. A living person, like ourselves, living in the same body, in the same form as we are, in a human body, that person having that awareness, having done exactly what I'm talking about, having gone within and discovered, that person is like a master for us. And if we get guidance from that person, simple guidance, it's not that he'll take us anywhere because he's going to give us guidance how he went in and you can go into. When we get guidance from such a person, we call him a master, we call him a perfect living master because living in his physical form right now. If, we, if he's living, and we think that we are getting an answer from God and we check with him, he says, no, that's your mind speaking. Because the mind always speaks, makes up all forms, makes up everything. Who can tell us if it is the mind speaking or the really God is uttering something? A person who has gone beyond the mind and knows the words of God. So that is why these perfect living masters are the one who discovered that the soul is not the mind, it is beyond the mind, and it empowers the mind. It gives life to the mind, it gives life to the senses, gives life to the physical body, and gives life to a physical world we see outside. That that power is lying inside us, and that's our own true self. This is where a lot of perfect living masters are able to take us, but they're very few, always. But then there are even more rare perfect masters. Out of perfect living masters, there are some who have gone beyond that point of discovering a soul. They have found out that the soul is not a unit by itself. It's part of one total consciousness. It's not separated from it. That our creator is not one soul. Our creator is the totality of consciousness. That the ultimate creator is just one source from which experience of a unit comes up. The experience of the soul is merely an individuated experience from that same single consciousness. The single consciousness can be as many individuated souls as it likes. 
It is like the example is given of an ocean. An ocean is full of drops of water. How many drops? Change the size of the drop, you, you can multiply it any number of times. So we are souls of that type. In totality of the ocean, we are drops. But we are not drops who are born out of the ocean. The whole experience I'm talking about has been created in the ocean, in the totality. What's happening within that, but we have projected through the mind an experience called time and space. That is great. We wanted to have all kinds of experience and we've done it. Good job to create worlds where we put so much reality into them that we think there's the only world. We are looking at this physical world and believing this is the only world because that's the only one we can see. That's the only one we are experiencing at one time. When we move to another world, go to a heavenly states, we find that's the only reality. The rest was delusion, so just made up. But that's become one reality. We go higher up, that becomes the only reality. At all times, we have created layers, levels of realities, and each level looks like the only reality we are in that level. It even applies to a level of experience below this physical, which we call the dream experience. Then we go to sleep and have a dream. We think the dream is here. At that time, we have no knowledge of the wakeful state. We forget the wakeful state, go to dream state and make that the only reality. We wake up, the dream is no longer real, it becomes a dream, this becomes real. We are doing it every day. So the same thing is true of every level of experience. It's all in our own self. When we dream, in the dream we may see a thousand people. We think they are all real. If we want to check out in a dream, is it a dream or is it real? We ask those people, are we all dreaming? They say, no, we are not dreaming. How can we all be dreaming? They are all real people. It's only when you wake up, you discover they were all made up by one dreamer. You were the only dreamer. All thousand of them were your part of your own dream. Similarly, when we awake to the next day, we find the whole creation was just part of your dream. And as you rise further and further, you discover that this creation is like a dream within a dream within a dream, a series of them. And every time we awake, we are reaching another level. So when we say we withdraw our attention back to ourselves and awaken ourselves, we are really talking of a state of awakening like waking up from a dream. Some people say, where is the proof? I used to study in a university where there were a lot of big thinkers, psychologists, and great questioners, skeptics about everything. They would tell me that, don't you think that all the areas of experience you are talking about, the mind can make up anything. It's a power of auto-suggestion that you are using upon yourself. You read in the books, there are all these things, you start imagining, and the power of suggestion is working in your mind and creating all these experiences. I say it's quite possible that this is all being generated by me. Indeed, I believe it is. You are talking of power of suggestion differently than I am. I am saying we are all creating our universe with the power of suggestion from the mind. You say only that person who is having a higher experience is creating it. No, we are all creating it. You tell me any evidence is not. The evidence is that we all are seeing each other. That happens in the dream also. In dream we all see each other and we wake up. There is nobody except us. Of course, some people in the dream, supposing we meet thousand people in a dream, when we wake up, we say, there were so many people, big crowd I met, but I only recognized five or six friends of mine there, who are here also in the physical world, but not all of them are here. Some I know are actually here. That means even in the dream, some people are not equally unreal. Some are real in the sense that they've come in your dream, but when you wake up, they're still there. What would happen if we were to observe who is real and who is not in these terms, that when we awake from a dream, we find we met so many people and know only a few of them were actually the higher level of wakefulness. And we awaken again, and there again we find that all the people we met in the physical world, they were made up of the dream. And there are some who are still there, and we communicate with them, I had a great dream, I saw you in the dream, and I saw many other people. And you awaken again and find a small group of people still there, 
what would happen if you kept on waking up? At the end, you'd find there was nobody else except you. That you were the only true real one. And there were some who were more real than the others. So reality of an experience of beings in which we have got shared consciousness, shared minds, that the reality of those can be discovered by awakening to these levels. But at any time, we are only accepting one experience as a reality. We don't mix up these realities. What about proof? When these people say, give a proof that these are real experiences. I say, give me a proof that when you wake up in the morning, it's the real world you wake up into. Has anybody, when they get up in the morning from a dream, who remember the dream, have they ever said, am I awake? Do I need proof? Do they call people, am I awake or not? Supposing a person wakes up in the morning and 10 people tell him, no, you are still sleeping, you're having a dream. Will he believe his own experience of wakefulness or will he believe what the people are telling him? He believes his own experience. Why? Because there's a very big difference between awakening and between just fantasizing a new situation or creating an auto-suggestion. When you wake up in the morning, how do you know it was a dream and you are now awake? How does everybody be so certain, 100% certain? There are some experiences, the experience itself carries its 100% certainty. Wakefulness is one of them. When you wake in the morning, you know you are awake. You don't have to open your eyes. You don't have to touch anything. You don't have to move. You're still in the bed lying in the same position which you were sleeping. And you know now you are awake. And you're absolutely certain you are awake. Nobody can deny that experience that you are awake. How is that? What makes you be so certain? The certainty comes from the fact that when you wake up, you discover you went to sleep. That's the only real significant thing. If you did not remember that, you would never be sure of anything. When we wake up, we remember we slept. Last night, we slept and now we are awake. No need to open eyes or get proof for that that you are awake. It's the same thing when you have these inner experiences. It's like awakening. It's like awakening and you remember you were there before you were even born here. That that life is much longer than thousands of years you have lived in a state from which the physical life was only a very small dream. And when you go higher, that you live forever. Ultimately, you find that you were never born, you never died. That state of consciousness created time, space, and dream within dream, and limitations of what you can experience in a time frame. It's all created from there. So these are such great, wonderful experiences, all lying within us, all which we can experience directly by going within under guidance from a perfect living master. If you want to go to the highest form, the form where you find that the totality of consciousness is only one, and it's all the whole show is taking place within that, that all the projections are taking place within that from within itself. If you want to have that knowledge, then that knowledge you can get within your own self with the help of a perfect living master who's already got it. If he hasn't got it, he can't guide you. Nobody can guide you more than where that person has gone. There are so many teachers teaching us different types of meditation, teaching us yoga teachers, teaching us different types of yoga, teaching us how to calm your mind, teaching us how to be peaceful, how to not get so angry, how to change life in certain ways. Some of them work, some of them make us more peaceful, some of them try to solve our problems. They're good to the extent they are. But a yoga teacher who's teaching you that can't tell you about consciousness, can't tell you what the consciousness is. Then there's a great mix-up between two forms of experiences we have. One is called energy and one is called awareness. We mix up the two. And often we use these terms very loosely. Oh, my energy was flowing from a consciousness. Energy does not flow from consciousness. Energy flows from the energy centers built into our systems. Energy centers are built into our causal minds, built into our sensory system, built into the physical body. The energy centers are specifically located in a physical body at different levels of the body itself, which we call the six chakras of energy, which lie behind the eyes, lie in the throat center, it lies in the heart, it lies in the navel, it lies in the genitals, and lies right at the bottom. 
these six centers are energetic centers and all experiences we are having which stabilize our whole energy, energetic equilibrium of the body is taking place in these centers. You put your attention in one of these centers, you get an experience of that energy. It does not mean your awareness expanded to know who you are. It does not mean you discovered your soul. There's no way. All the area in this physical body, below our eyes, only deal with energy and not with awareness. It does not deal with any higher awareness of yourself. It deals with energetic experiences. You can get ex different experiences and different centers of energy in the body. Most of the old yogic practices only deal with that. They believe that you want to have unusual experiences, go concentrate on these centers and you will have those unusual experiences. Many of these experiences can be, cre can be created by chemicals. Many of those experiences come by trauma. Many of those experiences uh, come otherwise in life. And for example, somebody says, oh, I do meditation. I see a lot of stars. As I hit you on your head and you see the same stars. <laughs> what are we talking about? Is that awareness? To have an experience of that kind, there's so many things. You can take a strong meditation. There are two professors who were there at the same time I was in the university. Dr. Richard Elkut, Dr. Timothy Leary. They were professors of psychology. They were experimenting at Harvard University with plants, first of all, because they heard that the um, Mexicans were using some mushrooms that they were able to get high. There's less CD can get high. So they got the mushrooms from Mexico, and they took them, and just with the chemical reaction, they felt they were high. So only energetic experience. Of course, then they isolated the LSD and the DMT in the mushrooms that they got them manufactured from Switzerland and got it out and experimented more. They used to have a yoga center in the greater Boston area when I was studying in Cambridge at that time. And those people used to share information. Once I attended a party where those uh, group of people were sharing experiences, I told them more about their experiences than they know, they knew. He said, you do? I said, I have never tasted any of these drugs at all. I've never tasted anything. He said, how do you know all this? I said, anybody can know by putting attention on these centers of energy. They open up the same thing. These are energy experiences that you can have in so many ways. Don't call it awareness of yourself. Don't call it to find out what your soul is and who you are and how the world is being created and how the universes exist. That awareness does not come from there. And then, they asked me to give a talk to their center. The title of the talk was, How to Turn On Without Drugs. <laughs> and I gave a talk on this subject at the university. I am only mentioning this because there is a big mix-up between energy and awareness. All the area of awareness, all that I have described so far to you, lies within a small space between the eyes and the top of your head. Nothing below that. Awareness exists there you go deeper and deeper into the different centers there. And there are, these are only six centers. There are 12 centers right there where you can put attention gradually one by one by drawing further inside and get more and more of the doors inside open up. That does not require that you go down from the eyes anywhere else in the body. So it's just physical. It's a physical, uh, psychic, psychological information that is being picked up by the energetic centers and create different experiences. It's not such a big deal that you say, oh, I have found out the truth. These two professors themselves, one went to India, did meditation under the name Karoli Baba and became Baba Ramdas himself and wrote wonderful books about his experiences. And he discovered that, that drugs were not necessary for these experiences. The other professor, Timothy Leary, he opened a church. They were both expelled from the university for these uh, experiments. And he opened a university on an island near Hawaii and he called it the island uh, of the ridiculous because he felt that the ridiculous and the sublime are the same thing. He discovered from studying of his mind. I mean, these are experiments that have been done for centuries all over the world. We've done centuries on what consciousness is and what it is. Here is a possibility with the help of a perfect living master to discover the entire spectrum of awareness that exists in, within ourselves and from which you can learn how the entire creation was made, who the creator is, what your relationship with the creator is, what the relationship of soul and God is, 
Are they the same? Is soul merely an individuated form of God? All these answers to these basic questions are lying inside us. So that's why I am sharing this information with you because I have had the experience of meeting and being guided by a perfect living master. So I had that experience. I am not sharing knowledge with you. I am sharing an experience with you. I am sharing something that we all have. It's not something unique to one person. It is not that you have to belong to this society, you have to belong to this religion, or you have to belong to your nationality, or you have to belong to a particular group, or you have to have color should be white or black or yellow, or you should be old or young, nothing of the sort. What I am sharing with you is open to all human beings without any exception at all. So that is why it's a very universal thing that I am talking about. If you examine this possibility of what lies inside us, I'm sure you at least want to alter your current life immediately. This life will be altered altogether because when you discover how it's being created, you discover what the show we are seeing is predetermined. It's very inside in the mind and being projected outside. Once you see only this part, you become happy, contented, and all no, no worry, no doubt, no fear. Imagine a life with these without these three. Supposing you are living a life in this very world with no worry at all because you know and you have no fear because nothing to be afraid of. It's all set up already. And you have no doubt in your mind, your clarity is so clear. These, these are side benefits of good meditation by which you can withdraw your attention inside. I hope those of you who are really seeking, who are really seeking this kind of experience, will get some benefit from my sharing this information with you. And certainly those who want more help, I'm willing to help those people who want to more help and the others also who can help us in this area. But only those who have themselves withdrawn their attention within themselves and discovered the reality and then shared with us, that's useful. Thank you very much for very patient listening to me.